This is the Norris Group's Real Estate Investor Radio Show, the award-winning show dedicated to thought leaders shaping the real estate industry and local experts revealing their insider tips to succeed in an ever-changing real estate market. Hosted by author, investor, and hard money lender, Bruce Norris. Hi, thank you for joining us. My name is Bruce Norris. Our special guest today is Leslie Appleton-Young. Leslie is the Vice President and Chief Economist of the California Association of Realtors, a statewide trade organization with over 200,000 members dedicated to the advancement of professionalism in real estate. Leslie directs the activities of the association's member information group. She oversees the analysis of the housing market and brokerage industry trends, member communication and membership development activities. She is also closely involved in the association's strategic planning efforts and is a well-known speaker in California real estate community. Leslie, you've been with us many times. We welcome you back. Uh, it's nice to be here, and that sounds so formal. I'm looking I know. forward to a <laughs> relaxed uh, dialogue with you on the show. Yeah, you've, you've been a friend of our company. You've been to our I Survived events on, on a panel and many times, and it's, uh, it's, you're right. We, we, can, we can be relaxed because I think right. what, what was interesting, the, the last time you were on the panel was the best panel we ever had, and I think it was because there seemed to be trust between the participants, and that was really great. Yeah, I think there was, and I think you had a lot of diversity. You had different opinions, and people were willing to listen and have some fun with it. And I agree with you. I thought it was a very um, informative exchange of differing views, which, you know, I think we're all at the point where we realize we have got to listen to each other, you know? <laughs> That would be a refreshing view. Could we could we tap that one in at the top? <laughs> well, I think, you know, it just let it begin with me. You know, I'm just trying to be start every day trying to have a fabulous day and be a better person. So hopefully that can spread around. Well what was really good about the that exchange was there was a lot of good ideas and it doesn't didn't seem like anyone was hesitant to give an opinion because it was received well and not aggressively fought because somebody had a strong stance. It was, yeah, it was just refreshing. And it was, it was one of those nice nights when I left. I remember thinking, well, that was, that was exceptional. Right. Um, right. You don't want everybody saying the same thing, you know, and uh, you want to learn from every exchange and you seem to have a, a skill at uh, putting together people where that will happen. So that was great. How long have you been the chief economist of CAR? You know, I started here um, in 84 um, after living on the East Coast for eight or nine years. And um, I kind of lucked out in terms of timing because five years after I started, my boss and the head of research communications, whatever else, Joel Singer, became EVP of CAR. And at that point, I was, um, I don't know if I was formally called chief economist at the time, but I was put in charge of the research department. So that was pretty cool, you know, to be here. I mean, not that I hadn't spent my entire 20s studying and all that kind of stuff, so I was a little bit late to the game, but to be at an organization uh, for five years and be able to get um, a promotion like that was pretty terrific. So that was about 89, 90? That was 89, exactly. Wow. So that was, uh, you know, you know me, I always relate everything to a chart. So right, here right. you are, you're at the chief economist, or at least acting sort of in that role at a very peak of the market, about to enter six sort of crummy years. Right. I mean, this whole thing about housing affordability and the affordability crisis and all that, you know, it's different every time, but we've been there before uh, in California. And, uh, it used to be a 10-year cycle. I have no idea what the cycle is. <laughs> You'll know that, right? You know what the length of the cycle is, because I'm confused at this point. But we used to, it seemed to me, gear up for another affordability effort uh, about every 10 years, the first uh, first couple decades I was here. Well, like you say, it, it, it kind of is different each time. I mean, if if you look at the severity, let's say, from, let's say, 90 to 96, and compare that to where we were 2008 to 2012, there's really no comparison. 
No, we didn't know what what it could look like, you know. And uh, I guess the thing to come out of all that is we know that markets correct, you know. And sometimes it's brutal, and lessons are learned, and you move on. And of course, now we're in, you know, this sweet spot where people can't get enough of real estate, and uh, it's uh, you know an environment where uh, real estate is kind of a preferred asset again but i will tell you what 10 years ago there were a lot of people not you but people that thought we'd never be here again and yet here we are and that's interesting that you say that because i guess i i know that there's everybody has a lot of equity you know prices have gone up a lot from the from the bottom where how far off of the peak are we from whatever that peak was you know it really depends on where you're where you're looking you know the Every every county in the Bay Area, um, not every county, but seven of the nine of them are all well above their prior peaks. You know, from '05 and '06. So San Francisco is like forty yes. percent above its prior peak. In the um, Central Valley, everybody's still well below their prior peak. And in Southern California, some are at or close to or light slightly above like orange san diego and ventura but san bernardino still well well below um they had a cyclical peak of 350 in the middle in the summer of 06 and their median now is around 245 250 something like that so um it really depends on where you are how much If that's the benchmark, you know, I don't, that's not the benchmark for everybody, but it's one benchmark to kind of look at in terms of gauging where you are in terms of equity. Has has that separation occurred before to where you have a San Francisco go from, say, 950 to 1.3 or 1.4 million and a Riverside San Bernardino be 30% less than their last peak? Has there been that spread before? Not yeah, ob- yes. I mean, the Inland Empire, the Central Valley, um, have la- and Northern California have lagged the coast. But we've never seen San Francisco like it is today, where there is just so much job creation, uh, tremendous demand, and the inability or unwillingness to really respond to it in any, you know, in any meaningful way. Um, you know, has created, um, I don't know if you want to use the word crisis, but, you know, we're seeing migration patterns. I mean, going back to the data, the last couple of years, the American Community Survey data is showing, you know, what you would expect, right? People moving from the peninsula to the East Bay, people moving from the East Bay out to, um, you know, Alameda Contra Costa's kind of edges, and then people moving, you know, to Sacramento and Tracy, and then really people moving out of the state. And this is the thing that I I find so fascinating. You know, 30 years ago, the only kind of contenders were the two coasts, right? The East Coast and the West Coast. And then you had the quote unquote flyover states. And then they were hit really hard, right? By the um, exit of manufacturing jobs. And we talked about the Rust Belt and all of this. And now if you look at, I don't know if you've seen the you know, the Milken Institute puts out that um, annual ranking of top performing large cities and top performing small cities. And it's really, um, you know, and it mirrors kind of the migration that we're seeing where Californians are moving to, you know, Nevada and Arizona and Texas, but they're also going to Boulder and Raleigh and Austin and Portland. So, that is my view of how this is going to play out. You know, I, I will never stop fighting for more housing in California, but just given the political and policy environment, I think the um, the solution is really going to be an acceleration of this movement towards um, more affordable housing and out of state to these clusters that are attracting um, you know, younger people just starting out who look at the prices in California and just say, you know, I I'm not going to be able to do it. Let me go somewhere where I can live uh, affordably and raise a family. Would it be accurate to say that 100% of the gain of population in California other than birth is immigration and we lose domestic migration? 
Yeah, I mean, we're and you know we're not losing the millionaires. You know, everybody likes to say, oh, you know, our taxes are so high, and they are. You know, we're losing millionaires, and that's not who we're losing. We're losing the middle class. We're losing the working class. We're losing people with, you know, high school and some college education, and we're losing, um, we're losing millennials. So this middle part of the income distribution is getting hollowed out because they just can't make it. And um, to a certain extent, the immigration has been a real plus for California in terms of jobs and keeping our demographic young. You know, without immigration, we would be a much older, um, an older state with a much um, more constrained um, labor supply. And obviously, you have, you know, the lower skilled immigrants, and then you have the, you know, H-1B visa, you know, very high skilled, higher skilled uh, people. So it's a little um, bipolar there, but that's actually been uh, one of the state's pluses compared to other areas. Now that that program hasn't always been around, correct? Where somebody can come and be a business or bring a business basically. No, no. I, I, I really don't know when it first started, but it's been pretty important for uh, certainly Silicon Valley. Do you see any do you have any concerns about the national uh, immigration policy going forward? Well, I think it depends on how it um, how it plays itself out. I mean, it could, you know, if you deport the three to four million undocumented um, people in California, that's going to have a pretty significant impact, for example, on agricultural workers in the Central Valley. Um, so I haven't seen any kind of full-blown analysis of it. I've just kind of what I've what I read, like everybody else does. But that is certainly a concern. The um, barriers to trade. If there were, you know, a trade war, that would have a big impact um, on Silicon Valley in particular. But we are just a very open economy here. We've got a couple of ports that are extremely large. Uh, you know, out in the Inland Empire, you've got all this transportation going on based on uh, goods coming in. So, I mean, there's all kinds of scenarios that are troubling that you can tell about what could happen. We, we're just kind of waiting and, and seeing, you know. You're, you know, you are in front of audiences many times a month. So what's, what's your take on the, you know, how are the realtors feeling about their prospects of making making a living and how happy their clients are that they that they bought something well i think they're notoriously optimistic and i am too you know i believe the cup is not only half full but it's refillable every day and i think you need to have that mindset uh to go forward um i i think they are optimistic because they remember what it was like 10 years ago and that's not where we are today you know we've got uh good price appreciation uh, things sell uh, very quickly, and it just isn't very helpful to look five or ten years down the line and go, "Wow, you know, X, Y, and Z isn't is is going to be um, going to be an issue." The the increase in rates that we've seen so far has uh, stimulated the market, if anything, you know, because it's given people a reason to act. Uh, you know, injected some urgency uh, into the market, but it certainly is understood that if rates go up, were to go up 300 basis points, it would be a problem for the market, particularly at these uh, prices. So um, in general, I mean, you know, we have such a kind of wacky industry where there are um, people that are very, very productive, and then we have a lot of um, members who just aren't really engaged in the business. And, you know, I think the kind of rule of thumb for most MLSs is that um, 50% of the MLS participants haven't had a listing in the last year. So the productivity is just highly skewed, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the things I love about the industry is that you can be a new realtor and come in and a couple, in a couple of years you can be having uh, a very uh, healthy business. It's just hard, you know. It's a lot of work. It's a uh, uh, it's not an easy profession. No, it's very competitive. And you know what's interesting is about the perspective um, kind of gets skewed when you when you show up. So if the first year you were in real estate was 2004, you would have a, a, a different uh, opinion than if you got in in 2000 and let's say nine or if you just got in last year. 
you know, you're, right. whenever you start, you think, okay, well, this is the norm. <laughs> right, right. In 2009, you'd obviously be a short sale specialist and hopefully um, be able to uh, dig deep in that market as long as it, it lasted. But, you know, one of the things I say, and this does sound very Pollyanna-ish, but I'm going to say it anyway, you know, this business for the individual realtor is about market share. It's not about the level of market activity necessarily. So I just try to pitch learn as much as you can, be the market expert, know the inventory, be able to talk um, intelligently about some of the key macro, you know, like what's going to happen to the mortgage interest deduction? Where do you see rates going over the next couple of years? How's my timing? You know, be able to engage in those kinds of conversations in a meaningful way, but don't let it define you know, your year, <laughs> you know, because there's always going to be people that need to move, you know, <laughs> always. You know, what's interesting, too, is the, the buyer also can have a different perspective of what their expectations are of buying a house. So yeah. can, can you speak to that? Because I remember there was a time where buyers were very interested in real estate because it was they knew it was going to go up um, 25 percent next year and that's why they were a participant but if you're buying in 2017 you probably are buying for a different reason than that participant way back in say 2004 or 5. Yeah I mean in 2004 and 5 I just think still a lot of people were buying for shelter you know that that was the um, price appreciation made it look attractive but you still need um, need a place to live. I think one of the biggest challenges we face is lack of financial literacy. Um, and I, I would hope that our organization and many others would, would be really realizing that uh, kids are graduating from schools without understanding um, what home ownership is, how to make it happen, why it is a long-term good investment, and those kinds of things. We did a survey of um, renters who were planning to buy within the next, you know, five years. And one of the questions we asked was, if you knew that you could qualify for a low, with a low down payment program, would you be out looking now? And like two thirds of them said yes. So then we followed up with, do you know about the FHA program? <laughs> and like 80% said no. <laughs> and I'm just thinking, wow, this is such an opportunity to go out and and really explain what's available because when you ask people like how much of a down payment do you need they say 20 to 30 percent and um, you know the VA program shows us that it's possible to do solid underwriting with low down payments I completely you know, the agree. big problem in 08 and 07 was not about down payments necessarily you know it was about a lot of um, a lot of other things so I think on the buy side um, it's education and it's also just what what I would call grit just staying in for the long haul because you have still got a market where over half of the transactions have multiple offers um, and many of them have you know double digits and more um, multiple offers even now you know now it, you know obviously you know there's market segments so <clears throat> at the very high end of the market you're not having that situation so much, but in entry level housing, yes. It's it's astonishing that, and I saw you know in preparation for talking to you today, I went through uh, several of your presentations, and that was one chart that surprised me, where such a low percentage of people knew that an FHA loan existed with a loan down payment, and I was thinking, well, if you think that you're, in other words, if you think twenty percent is what you've got to save, and you're way far away from it, you don't even you're not even engaged in thinking I could buy one, period. No, I mean, you're not doing any preliminary research whatsoever. And, you know, today, you know, we talk about housing affordability. Well, rental housing is very expensive as well. And so there's less of an opportunity add in student loan debt to really say that, you know, would take a long time. So if there is a way to qualify and get into a home with a low down payment government program where you are fully vetted, why wouldn't you want to do that? And my only answer is you don't know about it. So that's that's an issue we need to address. I, I really don't like to see our uh, owner occupant numbers go go down and, and likely to continue to go down. That that doesn't that doesn't please me at all. I want I want people to own their own properties and I 
I wish that they could make a practical decision. We've suggested this program before, but they could have a nothing down Fannie Mae program that would be really safe with two little caveats in the, in the loan. Um, allow it to walk to a new buyer if, the, if some reason there was a default. It used to be called a simple assumption where somebody could take it yeah. over without yeah. formally qualifying. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And the other thing is, okay, if this loan, nothing else works when you open the, the bid at a trustee sale, it's the late payments. So the, but the principal's not a risk. The, the bid will be 15 or 20 grand of back payments and someone else will take it over. That's that one change in those programs would allow us to get the percentage to go back up to mid 60s or so and i really think that's a good idea and you would take out the risk with just a couple of policy changes i think it's just hard to sell uh the times that i've been in front of people that make those decisions even if they thought what i was suggesting was a good idea they didn't think they could sell it and get it past the whatever the cut is Right, and you'd hope you're dealing with people who really are data focused, so they could run the numbers and see that that would work. Because I, I, I can't agree with you more. You know, the home ownership rate in California right now is less than what fifty three percent. It's ten percent below national. And you know, in my speeches, I say you know within five years we will be a majority renter state. Yeah. But there are cities, you know, Long Beach, thirty eight percent home ownership. So we are seeing this playing out uh, in micro markets today, and uh, you know there's just tons of, of data about uh, communities and the health of families being correlated with having a stake in in a home. So this is just much bigger than realtors and a transaction. This is really about a quality of life and community. Well, it, and in a practical sense, what you were talking about getting a loan. Um, it fixes your house payment. So you're on this journey as a, let's say a young couple, you're 30 years old, you're going to be making consistently more money probably for quite a long time. If you have a rental uh, payment, it's going to be variable and it's going to change and take always the biggest share of your income. But if you fixed your payment, you'll have spendable income going forward and ever increasing amounts. And I, I think that's what the policy makers should think about is that we're going to have some high bills to pay with people that are retiring and so forth, we better allow the person that's going to be footing that bill to have some extra spendable money by getting creative on the housing side. I really think that. Yeah, I agree. I think having certainty going forward and a fixed payment is just an incredible plus for people. Because as I mentioned, the rental market is, um, it's really, really tight, you know, and rents have been going up uh, very sharply. Now, in some areas, they're pulling back a little bit. You know, you've got this dance between, you know, condos and rentals and so on. Uh, but just in general, for the health of the budget uh, of the family moving forward, having, you know, a 30-year fixed rate loan, as long as we've got them, is just uh, an incredible gift that shouldn't be missed. Especially at these rates. Um, right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, we can't complain about four. I know we're sad we missed the three, but a four is not all bad. No, it really isn't. And, uh, you know, having been in much uh, tighter environments uh, in the past, I look at where they are now and where they might be going the rest of this year up a little bit more. But we are, you know, we are in, uh, kind of still in that sweet spot, if you will, I think. Yeah. If you, if you look at charts uh, going back, um, Sean O'Toole and I visited the Library of Congress and stayed there three days and pulled up newspapers from about 1850 on looking at advertised interest rates for 100 years and uh, just to f- make sure that we knew how special these interest rates were. Right, right. <laughs> and and they're really good. Yeah. We should have had a photographer following you. I would have loved to have seen some pictures from that weekend. Oh, my gosh. You know, it takes two nerds to think that's exciting to pull that one off. Well, I know. I mean, it, it's a very unique, uh, unique subset that you represent. I just love it. Well, you know, I, I've always wanted to figure stuff out myself. And so just rather than take somebody's word for it, I have to go see it. We're, right. we're almost out of time. What, what's the website people can go to for, for information about CAR? Uh, uh, car.org. Uh, and we do have, you know, public, uh, public information. Some of it is, you know, goes to our forms and our things just for members. But we do uh, have information out that's available to uh, to the public, and we try to be a source of 
uh, educational material and information on the on the housing market and the real estate transactions. So, um, and we also just unveiled a new website about two months ago, and it, it's terrific. Uh, the search function is excellent, so I would encourage anyone that uh, hasn't tried it out yet to go and uh, check it out. Got a lot of historical data too. Leslie, yes. thank you so much for joining us, and we'll uh, we'll pick this up in the next segment. My pleasure, Bruce. Thanks again. Thank you. For more information on hard money loans and upcoming events with the Norris Group, check out thenorrisgroup.com. For information on passive investing with trust deeds, visit tngtrustdeeds.com.